Welcome to My Life Chassidah Supplied, episode 363, a special Tisha B'Av edition. This program is dedicated by Greg and Chani Bell in loving memory of Miriam Bas Avram Yisachar, Yardzeit on the 26th of Tammuz, and Itke Bas Yaakov Menachem, Yardzeit 27th of Tammuz. I also want to personally dedicate it to my beloved mentor and colleague and friend, Rabbi Yael Khan, all of Ashalom, who passed away just this sixth of Av. And we will speak about him during this program. So we're now at the conclusion of Tisha B'Av, Tavshin Pei Aleph. It's almost 2,000 years from when we began sitting Shiva for the destruction of the second temple. You add another few hundred years from the destruction of the first temple. And Tisha B'av has personified, embodied the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. And we've had sad experiences in our history. And Tisha B'av is the epitome. So in many ways, Tisha B'av teaches us about rock bottom, that when all seems lost, it's a 24-hour fast day, begins the night before. The only other fast that that way is Yom Kippur, but Yom Kippur we fast for very different reasons. And all the other severities around Tisha B'Av conclude at the conclusion of nine days, at the conclusion of three weeks. So there's a build-up to it. So if you ever want to have a model of dealing with trauma, with loss, with death, with destruction, Tisha B'Av is it. So on one hand, yes, it's rock bottom. There's nothing lower than Tisha B'Av. On the other hand, the Medrash says that when Mashiach comes and when all will be redeemed and elevated, Tisha B'Av will be the greatest holiday. And indeed, next Shabbos, Shabbos Nachmu will be the 15th of Av, and Tisha B'Av then is elevated to the full moon Malchus reaching its epitome in the positive side of rebuilding. And you read the Tzera Chalia, every descent brings a greater ascent. As the Rebbe Rashab explains in his Tisha B'av and Tubav and Nachamu Maimorim of um, Tofresh Ayin, the year 1910, based on the Arizal, why it says that Tuba of there are no holidays among Israel. Besides, as great as Tuba of and Yom Kippur, we discussed this also last week. So within it also lies the greatest growth. And this is the essence of all healing and all recovery. And for all of us, there's no one in this world that hasn't been broken in some way. We've all had our disappointments. We all have, have our losses hopefully mild ones. But this world is filled with that. We don't live in a perfect world. Until the future, people die. May have asked him, shun 120 years, sometimes a little earlier. So how to deal with all of that is really Tisha B'Av's formula. On one hand, destruction. And the destruction of the Beis Amigdash didn't just bring destruction. It also brought of the temple, but it also brought murder, killing of so many Jews. And the exile, and all that went with that. And yet, just earlier today, during Mincha, we said Nachim. Nachim is comfort, be comforted. And Arizal explains, because in the throes of the abyss, in the darkest moment, Mashiach is born. As the Medrash says, that the person was, someone was traveling, northern Israel, and he stops by, and it's an Arab farmer, and he hears the cow moo. He says, your, your temple has been destroyed. And then Gosa Parase, a second time the cow mu, and he says, your redeemer was born. In the darkest moments, because ultimate, ultimately and fundamentally, there's no such thing as a dead end. There's no such thing as it's over. End. There's no such fatalism. The very existence of God tells you that there's a divine spark everywhere. It can be concealed. It can be darkened like a black hole. 
It could seem hopeless, but it's never that way. And that's what kept the Jewish people going throughout history, no matter what it was, whether it was the Egyptian exile and later the Babylonian destruction, the Roman destruction, in between the Syrians, the Greeks, the Assyrians, and that which came later in the Middle Ages, that at the end of the day, Tisha B'Av, yes, we sat Shiva, we dimmed the lights, we cried, we read lamentations, but we always knew that within it all lies also the birthing of something far greater. This past Shabbos Chazayin, yesterday, we're shown the Beis Amigdash from a distance, says the Vitzchuk Baditch, but that's why it's called Chazayin. So though the literal interpretation of Chazayin Yeshayel is the vision of Yeshayel of destruction, the truth is, it's also the vision of the future. So there are many visions. There's what you see right now, and there's what you see in the bigger picture. Like Rabbi Akiva, who smiled. So even though he tore his garments, he rent his garments when he saw the desolate Temple Mount, the destroyed Beis Amigdosh. And yet he smiled because he knew the story is not over. This is a lesson to each one of us collectively and individually. So, some of the questions. What does it mean that Mashiach is born on this day? Does it mean the person who will eventually become a Shia has to be born on the ninth of Av? Or does it mean the spiritual energy of the Messianic era is born out of the transformation of the negativity surrounding the destruction of the Holy Temple? The latter is definitely true. Whether Mashiach is actually born on Tisha B'av, that you can discuss. Look, we know that the people who believe Mashiach of the, every generation, the Nasi, and the Nasi is not necessarily born on Tisha B'av. But yes, the very essence and the energy of Mashiach is born on Tisha B'av. The Medrash and the Yoshami that I cited before can be interpreted literally. It could, literally, it could also be interpreted conceptually. So that's the answer, because at the end of the day, it's not just a technical birthday. It's why. It's because in that darkest moment, when the flames are highest, is when the birth of salvation happens. And that's why when the Babylonians entered the second, the first temple after it was destroyed, they saw, when they were destroying it, when they saw the kaperus, the cover on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the Kedush Kedoshim, they saw the Kerubim facing each other. They faced each other only with a sign of love. Because right at the moment of the greatest distance is also the greatest love. As explained in the in a number of places, the Rebbe explains it. Another question. Was the destruction of the Beis Midrash an example of Yerida Tzayr Chaliyah? And if so, why is Tisha B'Av considered a sad day if ultimately the energy of the day will be revealed to be a deeper and stronger positive energy? Because we honor the realities that we also experience. Though, of course, the end of the story will be that way. But right now, it is sad. People were killed. Tisha B'Av symbolizes very negative things. We're not oblivious of that. Remember, this isn't just a fantasy that greatness will arrive. It's also dealing and going through the pain. It's actually the pain that is the catalyst and gives birth to that higher growth. But we don't deny the pain. We just say it's not the end of the story. So just like it's a mitzvah, to stand up after Shiva. When I say mitzvah, we're told that after seven days you have to stop sitting Shiva. And then comes the second stage of mourning, the next stage of mourning. So too, while those seven days, one can't say, you know what, I see the Geula coming. Rabbi Akiva did rent his garments. He did tear his garments. Because we must honor the moment. It would be like saying, oh, death doesn't really matter. Of course it matters. It's a result of the Chetet Tzadas, the eating of the tree of knowledge. There's at least on a visible level some schism, concealment. So that's why Chesidah says, Tzimtzum b'shvil ha-gili. The Tzimtzum is in order to bring Gili, but the Tzimtzum itself is a hepacharatz, because that's not the end in itself. And while it's that state, we recognize that. So paradoxically, actually recognizing the darkness for darkness is actually what allows us also to recognize the light for light. If you make the darkness into light, 
then you won't really appreciate the light that comes afterwards. So we need to go through all the stages. And that's why we have Tisha B'Av then. We say Nachim in the middle of Tisha B'Av. But one doesn't negate the other. This is actually the, the power of it, that we actually navigate through the cycles. There is a storm, there is a darkness, and we recognize it. And yet we move forward, we navigate, we travel forward, we move ahead, we forge ahead. We are taught that when we are in Golas, the Shekhinah also is in Golas, and suffering alongside us. Yes, the Gemara says that, Shekhinah begalusa, Golu le'edem, Shekhinah ima. And the Jewish people were exiled in Edem, which is the Roman destruction of the Second Temple. The Shekhinah ima, the Shekhinah is with them. And when the, the, when the Jews go back, Shav Hashem Alekecha Shvuscha, he also returns from Golas into Golas. Since, therefore, since God is suffering and God, God can do whatever, she, whatever he or she wants, can God send Mashiach not for our sake but for God's own sake? An excellent question. But let, let's understand why did God go into Golas with us? Of course, there are levels of the godliness that are higher than Golas, that we understand. But there's a dimension of godliness that does go into Golas with us, engaging with us, part of our, all the different expressions that I'm with you in it. Erdana, God comes down, which means there's a dimension where the divine, divine energy enters into our reality. He sees the Jewish suffering in Egypt all the different expressions, that there's a level of divine because for two reasons. First of all, God did not leave us alone. He comes with us even when we are in a difficult time. Kav of course, so to speak, but he's there with us. Secondly, it gives us strength to be able to say, you know what, God is with us. God's strength is with us. Helps us endure and ultimately be freed. And finally, the whole purpose of existence was to make a home for the divine in this world. Let's talk before the destruction. If Hashem says, God says, build for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among you, that means he wants to dwell among us. And when the Mishkan is not there, the Beis Amigdash is not there, he's not dwelling among us through the physical structure. Yes, he's dwelling in our hearts and souls but he wants it also to manifest in the most physical possible way. So just as you can ask, why, just as he's in Golis with us, you have to understand he's also with us when there's Geula. So the idea that God should just escape and cover himself, so to speak, and he has nafshi itzalti in the expression, that he'll redeem himself from Golis, and not us, that's not, that's not an option. To say that he redeems us because he can do it, he wants us to be part of the process. And remember, we want the transformation of Golas, not the elimination of it. Goyla, Geula, the same letters. Redemption is from the same word Goyla. And you put the Aleph of Alufa Shalelem, the godliness we reveal in the material world, in Golas, in this displaced state. And that reveals Geula. So you need the Goyla. And he needs us to do the work. You could ask a better question. Why did God in the first place go into Golos and send us into Golos? Since he's not bound by it, and since he doesn't want to go into Golos, why does he let us all go into Golos? That's part of the process. Part of the concealment as the consequences of our behavior. And ultimately, you read the to redeem. And God also, godliness also benefits from that redemption. However you explain it, that something is added through our work, through our hard work in this world, and especially in the darkest moments. Who is Kamsa and Bar Kamsa is the next question, or their father and son? So the Gemara and Gitten, and the Sugiya connecting to the destruction of the temple, Dafn Uvav, Zahayin Uvav, Nuzai in those pages. So it says, among other things, that the Beis Hamidrash was destroyed due to the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. And the Gemara tells the story that there was an individual who doesn't name the person who threw a party, he sent his assistant or a servant to go invite his friend Kamsa. 
but he also had an enemy whose name was Bar Kamsa. They were no relation to one another. The, ser the servant mistakenly went to the enemy and invited Bar Kamsa instead of Kamsa. Bar Kamsa comes to the party. The host, who was his enemy, goes over to him and says to him, there's an enemy of a person here, talking in the third person, both about himself and the enemy. So you should leave. He says, please don't embarrass me. I'll pay for my meal. No, leave. I'll pay for half the banquet. No, leave. I'll pay for the entire banquet. No. And it takes him physically, the Gemara says, and throws him out. But comes, of course, besides the embarrassment and the shame and the, the wickedness, also there were chachamim there, where there were scholars there, sages, and they were quiet. So Kivan the Shaska, because you were quiet, Bakamsa said, that means you agree. And then he went and informed on the Romans about the Jewish people, and the story continues, where he incites the emperor of Rome against the Jews, encouraging him to send an offering. He wounds the offering, so the offering should be not kosher to be able to brought as an offering in the temple, in the altar. And the bottom line is that the Gemara elaborates there a little time later that this temple was destroyed. So the story itself needs much analysis because you can say just the mere fact that he treated him in such a way, sin as chinam, baseless hatred. That's what ultimately caused Bar Kamsa to do what he did. So the answer to your question, Kamsa Bar Kamsa were not related. Not father and son. How was the mistake made and the wrong person invited to the banquet? And why didn't the rabbi speak up and stop a man from being humiliated in public? Well, human mistakes happen. But obviously, there was a deeper story here. Here's not the place. I intend at some point to dedicate a class dedicated to explaining that Gemara. It's a long Gemara, several pages, which has many, many questions and understanding the deeper story behind the story. But regarding the actual mistake, clearly there's more going on. Why did he hate him in the first place? Why did they hate each other? And who was the person that threw the party? Why didn't we told the name? And the names that Kamsa and Bar Kamsa are similar, so similar. Kamsa and Bar Kamsa are the son of Kamsa. The Gemara does not indicate they were related. So how do we understand all these details and many more? And then the continuing story. I mean, you could stop right there and say, due to that baseless hatred, that was enough. We need to know the whole ensuing story. But to answer the questions, Clearly, even when a person makes a mistake, the Alter Rebbe says in the Gerus that there's something in the Nefesh Abamis that led him there. The problem was the hatred, it wasn't the invitation. It wasn't the mistake in the invitation. In a way, it almost sounds like it was a setup that he would humiliate his enemy. So not that he wanted to do that. He invited Kamsa. But clearly, that hatred was the real problem. And that's ultimately what led to what happened. Let's say Kamsa was invited. He still hated his Bar, bar Kamsa. Why did they hate? It just was expressed during the party. So you can say subconsciously there was that element that needed to be cor corrected, and it wasn't. Unfortunately, he could have controlled himself and let him stay at the party, especially he was getting paid part of it or all of it. And he didn't. So that just shows you how much hatred there was. Even the money was not an incentive. But this is all connected to the entire discussion, including the Mishnah that precedes it, which is all related, as I said, I hope to discuss this at one point. Regarding the question why the Chachamim didn't um, respond, why didn't they do anything? So the Masha and others seem to say they weren't in control, that they were all either because they were af afraid of or they were indebted to uh, the host, or something similar to that. But that itself begs a question. What does that mean? But clearly there was, a, at the time then, things were not in a beautiful place. And we see this, uh, the subsequent story, 
the Sinas Chinam continued, when the Buryonim, the zealots in Yerushalayim, burned all the resources. So the Jews would have to fight the Romans instead of trying to negotiate with them. Yet another act, a violent or aggressive act. So clearly, it wasn't just one thing that happened. The climate was one of divisiveness, of hatred, of anger. One thing Hashem could have forgiven. But since that was the environment that the Jewish people were not getting along with each other, that's what the, similar, the simple meaning, not just one person didn't like another person. So how can a father be at peace with his children in a temple when they're fighting with each other? So there was the Siluk HaShchina and the Churban Habayis, the destruction of the temple. But again, in order for us to repair it, through Avas Chinam, through baseless love, through unconditional love for each other. Which leads to the next question. Dear Sunday night Sadiq, if the Beis Amidus was destroyed due to Sinas Chinam, when then will the opposite, an act of Avas Chinam, meaning baseless love, meaning unconditional love, not a love due to any reason, just free love instead of just like baseless hatred, will that be what it takes to rebuild and ultimately bring Mashiach? Is that perhaps the reason the Friedrich Rebbe taught the importance of starting davening by first saying, Hareni mekabal alai mitzvah sasei shal v'haftarecha kamoicha? The answer is yes and yes, but with some additions here, some edits. That is clear, the Rebbe says a number of times that avas chinam is the tikkun to sinas chinam. No, it's not just loving someone because there's a reason, but without any basis at all, just to love, which was correct and repairs that baseless hatred that was shown during that time that caused the Beis Amigdash. So just like baseless hatred caused the Shechina, caused the divine to be concealed and the temple destroyed, Avat Shechina draws the, te- the Shechina back down. Bot la Mesubav. You get rid of the cause, you get rid of the result. As far as Harani Alai, first of all, it precedes the Friedrich Rebbe. It's in Siddur. It's in Sidurim that preceded the Friedrich Rebbe. Al Rebbe put it in Sidur. The Rebbe has all sicha about it in 1984. Um, in a sense, encouraging everyone to say the Hareini Alai. But the answer why we say Hareini Alai is exactly that. It's a machzadik in Mitzvah Savis Yisrael, and Derech Mitzvah Secha explains. Because tefillah is like a carbon, and before you bring a carbon, you have to have no mum. The Jewish people are like one organism. If all the Jews are not one, you can't really daven, you can't bring a carbon properly. One of many different explanations given. But also, in the same context here, that Avis Yisrael is a foundation for all brachas, Klal Godl Betera, and especially, of course, the Gula Mitis Vashlam. Yes. It's said that every shul is like a small base amigdosh. Why can we? Why can we commission builders to erect new synagogues in our neighborhoods, but we are not allowed to hire builders to build the third base amigdash? Okay, the Migdash Ma'at, which is the mini sanctuary, as Hashem tells Yechesko, when the Jews will go into Golis, how will they connect with me? They'll build a the Migdash Ma'at. That will be for them a mini sanctuary in their shuls, but they can see us about the midrashas. But that was given to us to build. The Beis Amigdash is not something we can build on our own. It is God that tells us when you build a Beis Amigdash. Both the Bayesishan, the Bayesheni. So the Beis Amigdash Ashlishi is not up to us, it's up to God. How that will happen exactly, so there are different ways to understand it. Whether the Beis Amigdash is already ready, Bani Meshuchlo in heaven. And all it has to do is come down below, and all we need to do is put up the pillars. There are different ways of explaining how it will be rebuilt, but it has to come by command of God. And that's actually the sign. That when Hashem commands and Mashiach rebuilds the Beis Amidish Ashlishi upon the command of Hashem, God, then you know that he's Mashiach Vade, he's certainly Mashiach. Because we're talking Beis Amidish Ashlishi is more than just a Migdash Ma'at. It's a symbol, not just of a building, it's a symbol that the world is now ready to have the divine presence in the fullest sense of the word, in Yerushalayim, Har Habayis, with the whole, the whole, the details, and the entire structure of the Beis HaMezh Ashlishi, with the Kedosh Kedoshim, and so on. Okay. 
since we're talking about Tisha B'Av, Mashiach, hi Rabbi Jacobson, I believe the Rebbe has taught us many times about learning in Yoni Mashiach because it prepares and excites us to be ready for Mashiach. Correct. So it's not just learning about it, to know what it's about, and that is a zgula, but actually by learning about it, you become Mashiachdik. You know what it is, you can relate to it, and it becomes personalized. In that spirit, can you teach us something interesting about Mashiach? Thank you. Very good question. I think that when you understand what Mashiach is in general, and not necessarily even something specific, that alone is exciting. To put it in simple English, if you were to able to define what is considered the most fulfilling life, the healthiest life, the richest life, where you are actualized, your family, and I don't just mean on the basic level of having health and life and parnosa income and harmony, but in the deepest possible way. Whatever your answer will be, that is Mashiach and Geula. For some reason, and that's probably because we weren't educated properly, and that's part of what we need to correct when we learn about Gula and Mashiach. Mashiach is presented almost like a fantasy. Mashiach will come, the world will be world peace, it will be something that will be like never before. It's not translated into that relatable language, how you and I are connected to it. al Rebbe says in the beginning of chapter 37 in Tanya, Hinegilizeh, of the Mesa Mashiach, the revelation of Mesa and Chisa Mesa, which is the, the which is Gilead and Sof sort of Be'elam Azagashmi. Keep those words in mind. The divine, infinite light in this world, totally be Masenu Avedaseinu, is dependent on our Maisev Aveda, on our actions and behavior and our work, because Char Mitzvah Mitzvah, uh, the Mitzvah we do, that itself releases energy called Mashiach. So it is when we live up to our per- our mission in life our calling, we are essentially bringing and revealing a piece of Mashiach, like a building block. When that accumulates, you have Geula. So when you think of it that way, very concept of Mashiach and Geula, that itself is more than just interesting. It is essentially everything we stand for, everything we hope for. So when we say, as I mentioned before, that you put the Aleph of Aluf Shalom, the Aleph of Godliness, into Geula, which means into the activities of our life right now. You bring Geula, you're saying we're not changing the world in the physical sense, especially in the first stages. You don't need a miracle, as the Rambam explains. The very world that you see right now, that you look out the window, or in your home, or the streets that you walk, will be saturated, will be permeated with another dimension. So when you think of it that way, the Mashiach becomes part and parcel of who we are. What's lacking is our awareness and then implementing it. But it's not some outside superimposed force. It is everything that you are and more. To put it in simple English, it's, Mashiach represents not just what, who you are, but who you can become. Not just your actual life right now, but your great potential being actualized. As far as specifics go, I mentioned before Mashiach's birth on Tisha B'av, which really means that in every challenging situation on laws, there's a, a birthing of redemption. That's a very powerful um, element. And I've shared a number of times already, but I'll say it again, just as an example to explain this idea of how, what, will be, what life will be like when Mashiach comes. The letter of the Rebbe about the, to, the, to the dry cleaners how we can learn from dry cleaning a lesson in the divine. That just as a garment that you wear many times gets soiled, and you think you have to throw it out, no. You bring it to a cleaners, they submerge, they submerge it in water, in warm water, mixed with chemicals. Then you put it under an iron and you have a fresh garment. So too, human beings, the soul begins pure, but life soils, stains, and all the different things we go through in life that break us. But all is not lost. You can renew everything. You submerge the neshama in mayim, in water, in mayim alatayda, in warm water, varamkait, warmth, passion. 
you mix different chemicals, different mitzvahs, you put it under Kabbalah sale, that type of like responsibility and commitment to something greater than you are, and the Nisham is refreshed and renewed. That's a beautiful lesson of its own. But a perfect example of Aleph in Goylet turns it into Gula. After I read that letter from the Rebbe, which was written in Tavshin Yud Aleph 70 years ago. So when I walked the streets of my neighborhood, I never looked at dry cleaners again the same way. I saw, ah, there's cleaners. It's not just a place where I bring my clothing next time I need to. It's a lesson in life forever. And the same thing is with the bakeries and the grocery shops and the pizza shops and the sushi places. And not just food, for eateries, but all types of places. Everything has that dimension. I mean, essentially, if you live that way, anything you look at, you see a tree, you see a bird, you see a star. You see a stone. You see Tisha above. Look for the Aleph within it. Find the lesson, the divine lesson, the lesson of Vedas Hashem, how you can apply it. Because everything is Ashgach and Pratis, everything is divine providence. Baal Shem Tov says everything is a lesson for us in serving God. But here the extra dimension is the Aleph that makes the Gela into Geula. I hope I fulfilled your request. And we'll speak more things. There's, I have actually a whole bunch of questions about Mashiach, interesting questions we'll, we'll cover in the coming weeks. Always a topic that, that should be at the top of our agenda. But for now, as Tisha B'Av comes to a close, we're talking about revealing the Geula in this darkest moment, in this darkest day which focuses primarily when you see negative things, and unfortunately we've seen them, especially recently in the last year or two, to look for the gu'ul in that as well, while being sensitive to the loss. So that's a good segue to the next question. How does one deal with anxiety resulting from the recent tragedies? Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. It's with a heavy heart I tell you that my friend's nine-year-old son was hit by a car and killed about two or so hours before this was typed. Baruch Dayan Emes Ad Mosai. This was the tragic death in uh, Chicago this past week. Months ago, after listening to cold case stories during work, I started feeling anxious about death, wondering what it's like, what, is, what, uh, what a person's last moments were like, what, what's his mourning was, what's his, what his mourning was like. And I, have to stop, and I had to stop listening because of how depressing it is. Now we have unfortunately had tragedies this year, starting with Miran, then the building in Surfside, and now this among one other passing in my community of Chicago. These, added, these all added fuel to my anxiety for fear of about death. This makes it all too real. Is the anxiety and rather sad thoughts and wonders about death and dying coming from the Sahara to bother me? How does one deal with these apichsidis? We should only hear good news. Thanks for everything. Well, Tishabov offers the answer. Yes, dwelling on negative things in a way that causes you to be depressed or anxious or demoralized. The Alta Rebbe already established in Tanya, page 20, chapter 26 and on. Anything that demoralizes is coming from the Yetzirah, from a bad place, because it doesn't have any benefit. All it does, it paralyzes you, makes you feel inadequate, makes you feel despondent. It's not empowering. If you feel something happens, and the words of the Rambam, a catastrophe happens, and you don't see it as an accident, God forbid, which would be insensitive and cruel, but you learn from it and say it should motivate you into introspection, soul-searching, correcting, becoming a better person, being kinder and gentler, then the tragedy has turned into something in you, something positive. It's not justifying the tragedy. We always hope and pray we shouldn't have any tragedies. But then there's a motivation that comes from it. Once it happens, something motivates you. So this focus and obsession with death and so on, no, that's not a Torah way. 
And I'm glad you stopped, and I tell you right now to stop now. You'll say, well, these thoughts just come to me. Think of it this way. You want to do justice. You want to redeem. You want to honor someone that was lost in a tragic way. Do something good for them on, on their behalf and their merit and their honor. That's the Jewish way. And that's the way we were taught. Does it make the pain less? No, but it channels it into something positive. So there's no answer to these questions, why these things happen. So we have two choices. We either, well, three choices. You could just ignore it, which is insensitive and cruel, as the Rambam says. You can dwell and obsess with it, and it only brings negative stuff. Or you can turn it into a catalyst and to catapult you as a springboard to greater growth. And that's what Tisha B'Av teaches us. We don't ignore what happened. We go through Tisha B'Av. We fast. We sit on low stools. We dim the lights. We cry. We say kinus. We say things that are extremely painful to hear. And yet we say nachen. We know that this will give birth from the ashes and these the flames will give birth to Mashiach and do give birth and to redemption of each one of us and all of us. And that's what we pray for. So yes, this year and two has not been easy. Many losses, tragedies. But this is who we are. And that's what we learn from Tisha B'Av. Another person writes, Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov Davin at the future site of the Beis Amidus and started Shachris Minche Mayrif. Avram Shachris Minche Mayrif, Yaakov, Yitzchak and Yaakov in which we daven for the Gula in their schus. May we have Mashiach now. Avram daven on a mountain. Miran is on a mountain. Yitzchak daven on a field. Givad Ze'ev, where the new Karlina Shul was being dedicated, has been a field. Yaakov called the site where he daven Beis Kale, the house of Hashem. Miami Surfside Collapse were people's homes. The Rebbe said it is time for Mashiach already. We don't know why Hashem makes things happen. Hashem needs to bring Mashiach now. In the merit of the Ovis, Please comment. Well, though we never like to find associative uh, Ramazim hints and allusions to negative things, it's interesting what you point out. And again, the main focus has to be how this leads us to growth. How it leads us to connect to Avram Yitzchak and Yankiv and to Shachis Mincha Mayrev, to have Chesed Gvurit Teferes, the three pillars of Teir Avedi Gimel's Chasadim, upon which the whole world stands and upon each Elam Katn Adam human being stands. The Rebbe said to build every home should be a base Chabad, a base Teira Vedim Mils Chasadim. So all of that is what this should lead. If one finds this hint and relates to it, it has to turn into action, positive action. That's my comment. I don't like to dwell again on just hints and Ramazim because what's the action that comes out of it? It can become, it, it, I don't want, you don't want it to become sensationalistic. Okay, we found another hint to what happened. We want it to turn into, as I said, to take the har and to take the sada and to take the bias and turn them into divine homes and divine mountains and divine, and divine uh, fields and turn it into a divine dir b'tachtenim in this world. And basil a a garden that will shine and glow forever and ever. A redemption that will be permanent and not have any golas ever again following it. Okay. So then what's next? What comes next after Tisha B'Av? Well, we go into the Parsha Veschanon and Shabbos Nachamu, which is also the 15th of Av, as I mentioned. So here's the second half of the story. From the darkness, we go to the light. And what, furthermore, the month of Aryeh, the month of Av, where the Yalkut Shemini says that God sent a lion to destroy a lion. In the month of the lion, Almanas, in order to send a lion, the divine, to rebuild the lion, the Beis Amikdash, in the month of the lion of Av, of, 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 which will lead Aryeh an acronym for El Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur Yishayin Rabbah, which will lead into El and to the great high holidays. Ultimately Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, born from the pain, born from the breaking of the tablets, born from the Chet Egel that comes during these days, as I've discussed a number of times. So let's talk about that now. 
Dear Rabbi Jacobson, there's a medrash that says Meshe Rabbeinu said 515 different prayers to beg Hashem to let him into Israel. Yes, that's Veschanan, is Gematrit 515. This Parsha coming, Parsha Veschanan. This is also alluded to in the name of the Parsha Veschanan, which is Gematrit 515. At that point, Hashem asked him to stop praying because if Moshe would have said one more prayer, God would have to change his mind and let him enter Israel. I have a few questions on this story. What is the significance of 515 versus 516? And why would adding a 516th prayer tip the scale? Also, why did Moshe agree to stop at 515 to honor God's wishes? If Moshe was truly trying to honor God's wishes, maybe he shouldn't have said any prayers and just accepted his faith, his fate, when God originally told him, you're not allowed to enter the land. I also want to share a personal story. I'm an older single, and for many years I had difficulty finding a shidduch. Inspired by Meshu, I am named after, I decided a few years ago to write 515 prayers in a notebook based on 515 different situations in my life. I went out of my way, the 500 situations of my life, when, when I went out of my way to do a mitzvah. I titled the page, The 515 Reasons God Must Bless Me with the Shidduch. So he wrote in his notebook, 515 different situations where he went out of his way to do a mitzvah. And, that, and I titled the page, The 515 Reasons God Must Bless Me with the Shidduch. I read these prayers at the Kotel and at the Forum of Tzaddikim all over Europe. It took a few years, but it worked. God blessed me and Chai Rivka, and we're getting married on August 1st. I just want to add, hopefully someone or some group in the community can compose a prayer called the 515 Reasons God Must Bless All Jews with Material and Spiritual Wealth and must send Mashiach in a revealed manner right away. And if applicable and appropriate, the prayer can be amended to the 500, to, to 516 Reasons. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing that story. Very inspiring. The question, of course, is if God was going to say no, why did he allow him to pray 515 times? Another question, Tzadik Gezer HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mekayim. Tzadik decrees something, the Ebershtah fulfills. So why didn't the 515 prayers fulfill? And as I said before, if it wasn't going to help anyway, why even allow Moshe to pray 515 times? And what's the significance of 515? So briefly, Every prayer of Moshe helped, obviously. It didn't help for him to go on to Eretz but it helped for the Jewish people to go on to Eretz And perhaps you can say that through the generations, these prayers made it easier to bring the Geula. Who knows how, what kind of impact these tefillahs had on all the challenges we've had over the centuries and that we're here today and that will ultimately march into Eretz Yisrael with Moshe Rabbeinu. So each prayer had its effect. 5.15 explains that Samach Tzadik, the Rebbe cites in the Sichas, connects it to Tov Kuf Tezvov, which is 515. Tezvov is, is Yud K, and Tov Kuf is 100 times Yud K, the Gilu of Yud K. So there's explanations, look in the Sichas in Tov Shinu, Nun Aleph, this uh, Pasha Veschan, and where he cites the explanations, what means Tov Kuf, the 100 within Yud K, with the Yud K within 100, there's different ways it's explained. Why Dafka these 515? But these are 515 Hamshachas, no doubt. About what he, what he said, one more prayer, would it have worked? I mean, if Hashem didn't want it to work, it wouldn't work whether it was 516. So I don't remember seeing that. But you could say that the 515 was necessary for that time, and one more would have been the next step to bring, it to, to bring him into Eretz Yisrael. And that was not going to be. So it wasn't because Moshe had the power after 515 to achieve it, it's because the 516th prayer would have broken through a new dimension. But the time wasn't ready yet, and Moshe didn't go into Eretz Yisrael, not just as a personal matter, because, the, because if, had he gone in, the Geula would have come, and the, the world wasn't ready yet for Geula. That's the ultimate explanation. But then comes the question, so what did Hashem say? So the next question, Moshe begged God to let him enter Israel. And the Pasha God says, no way. You can't enter Israel, but you can go on top of the mountain and look at the land. What was the purpose of this? Was God teasing Moshe and rubbing it in and saying, look at the land, look at the land. Sorry, you can't enter the land. 
So the same with the tefillah. When a tzaddik looks at something, it wasn't a sightseeing thing. Obviously, Moshe wasn't interested in looking at the land as some people look at something from a distance through binoculars or something like that. Moshe wanted to go into the land, as the Gemara says, because he wanted to be mekayim the mitzvahs, that adafka natchesrol, and the shlemus of that would be with the geula and so on. But the looking of the land was when a tzaddik looks at something, he edels the eis, he refines it, and he makes it easier for the Jewish people to actually go into Eretz Yisrael with Yeshua. The Ragachova says this. That's the tzaddik's vision. I remember the year Tav Shinun Beis, when the Rebbe looked at each one of us when we were benching Lula of Anesrik on Sukkis. And no one understood at the time until later that year when the stroke came. So I always was thinking the Rebbe's look, besides was a form of maybe saying goodbye physically, but also the Rebbe's look has an effect on someone. And the Rebbe wanted to see each person. The Ramban in the beginning of Bamidbar explains why is there misper, the minion, the census of the Jewish people? So Rashi says, because of their preciousness, when you hold something precious, you count it all the time. So there are the ten senses, the ten counts throughout history. And two, two in the Sefer Bamidbar, Sefer Hapkudim. But the question is why? What's counting have to do with love? So the Ramban there says, because when you count something, you have to look at it. If it's just one big group, you don't look at each individual. When you love something, you want to look at each individual. You count, you're looking at each one. So Moshe's look had an impact. That's why you find Baxism, they say, I didn't see the Rebbe, but look at, I, look at eyes that have see, seen a Rebbe. They wanted to see another set of eyes that saw a Rebbe. Because there's something about that power of sight in Kuntra Savedi he talks about it at the beginning. Okay. Another question. Good morning, Rabbi Simon. Why were the Ten Commandments given separately from the rest of the 613 commandments since they are all included, are also included in the 613? And are they more important than the other commandments? So in this week's Pasha, we read again the Seres Adibris for the second time. First time they're read in Pasha Yisrei. The Rebbe has a very powerful Sikh in Tovshin Nun Aleph, I believe. And it talks about the comparison of the two Yisrei. The comparison of the two Aseris Adibris. Do they correspond to the two luches, to the two set of tablets that were given by Shavuos and the second one given Yom Kippur and other details. But regarding the actual question, because the Teir is Klolos Protis Nemra. That's an expression in Chazal. It's Klolos Prat. The Teir is given in many details, but the details are all included in a bigger Klolos in a bigger general category, and then a bigger general category. Just like a child is conceived one cell, and then one cell splits into two, and two into four, everything in life works that way. The whole Seydish Tashlis works that way. Tzimtzum Arishan, then comes a Kav, and the Kud, the Kav, Shetach, everything goes in a process. So the Teda too begins with that way, the way that our God created the world. B'reishis Baralakim is a Shemayim Vesara, says Rashi. Everything was created in day one, like in a nucleus. And then, each day, it broke down into the details of that creation of that day. So the Teira is also that way. The Rebbe cites off in the Friedrich Rebbe's Vart. The whole Teira is included in the Aser Sadibris, Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are included in the first two, Anoichi and Layilacha. As the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, Anoichi is the root of all mitzvah, positive mitzvahs. Layilacha is the root of all negative mitzvahs. And Anoichi and Layilacha are both included in Anoichi, and Anoich is all included in the Aleph. So when you teach a child Aleph, really everything is in there. And that will then branch out and become and break down into all the details. So that, that's where the Ebrister started the Teter with the Seres Adibris. Ten general principles within which in Kol HaTeter Kul is Michal Rasag says that the, 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 the letters, all the Tariyag Mitzvahs are included in the letters of the Seres Adibris. So that's the general answer. And therefore, the Aser Sadibris are the foundational principles upon which all the Torah is encompassed. Okay. What can we do when we need God to make a miracle for us? Well, this has been a big theme of our discussion in this program. We daven Tashem, 
we make a keli through our activity. God can obviously do a miracle when he wishes to, but for us to be a container for it, we do things. Torah and mitzvahs in general, tefillah, avis Yisrael, love, shalom. Le motza kodesh baruch hu klei magzik baruch hu ela shalom. Le lomei, le motza kodesh baruch hu be lomei klei magzik baruch hu. Shalom, unity, ardus, av, love and unity, barchenu avinu, brings the blessing of our father when he sees his children united. So all these things are the kalim that we do. So even when things sometimes seem difficult, challenging, setbacks, as we said, within it lies all the blessings they need to be revealed. And we reveal it by forging ahead and being positive and turning any negative into a catalyst for greater growth. So now I'd like to dedicate some, a few minutes to the passing of Rabbi El Khan, the iconic Rabbi El Khan. He came to America, first time Friedrich Rebbe approved after several times not approving. And he arrived on the boat when the Friedrich Rebbe, right after Friedrich Rebbe's histalkis. When they left Israel, they didn't know that. Rabbi El arrived with others. And he asked the Rebbe and the Rebbe told him to stay. And he became the main chayzer, chief chayzer, which means someone that repeated the Rebbe's fabrengans from that early stage. He was 20 years old then, born in Tofres Tzadik. So Tof Yud, 20 years old, as a bocher, and excelled at remembering the Rebbe's words, documenting them. The Rebbe would edit them. Four years later, he would get married to his Rebbetson. May she be well and healthy. 1954, Tafshin And he became a, a piece of the furniture, if you wish, one of the pillars in the development, especially, of publishing and preparing for publishing the Rebbe's words. One of the greatest chusim you can have. The Maimonim and the Sikhs that the Rebbe delivered year after year, all those years. I did not meet him till later because I wasn't even born then. He also was a mashpia in Temchit Bimim, main mashpia. Tremendous koyach has brought a power to explain chassidus. In many ways, you can credit him with bringing chassidus alive, the richness of chassidus to thousands and thousands of people. Mashpiim, leaders, lay people, in Chabad, outside of Chabad. Brilliant in explaining the the depth and the significance of how we connect with God, Ahdus Hashem. And of course, later, became the chief editor appointed by the Rebbe to, of Sefer Erchim Chabad, the encyclopedia of Chassidus, that he personally composed and edited when the first edition came out, the first volume came out in 1971, the Rebbe was very impressed and said, I knew he's good, but not that good. And of course, throughout the years, we heard from the Rebbe different expressions of Rabbi El's goodness and greatness. I personally met him, well, as a child, he was, the, as I said, iconic. The Chayzer was always, from a distance, you felt there was a man with a long beard able to remember hours and hours of the Rebbe's Fabrengans and then prepared them. And he had that, uh, like that legendary status. Um, I first learned by him in uh, Ocean Parkway, in Lutem Chet Mimim, when I was 14, 15 years old. He taught us Tanya in uh, Ocean Parkway in the evening chassidus. He would also farher us. He would come and test us, I remember. <laughs> we were a bunch of troublemakers, to be very honest. <laughs> it was... He deserved better. <laughs> you know, they should have given him a... Do- I mean, he did. He was taught also the older Bachrim. But it was, it was not his, his forte. It was discipline of a bunch of wild uh, Indians. But he, he dealt with us. And he taught us. And I'll just share. I remember the first idea that I heard from him as a kid, basically. 
that uh, touched me, that impressed me, was he was explaining to us Derech Mitzvah Mitzvah Tzitzis, the concept of Er Primi, Er Chezer, and Er Yashar. So like the sun and the moon, the sun like a mashpia is an air energy that flows forward and the levana, the moon, is like an energy that's the er amakabal, the energy of the recipient. But he explained the energy of the recipient is not just a passive entity. And he asked the question, I remember, he said, look in outer space, you see many bodies and they're not shining. The moon reflects the sun. Why doesn't, let's say, an asteroid reflect the sun? Or other elements uh, that we see that they're dark. Just like when you see the sun shines on earth, the stones don't begin to shine as a result. So he explained because the Levona has in it a special Eirah Makabal. It's not just passive energy, it's actually an active energy that needs to be revealed. And since not Seifan B'tchilas and B'tchilas and B'seifan, the Sof actually is a Kali for the Resh. He told us that this is one of the Chidushim of the Rebbe. It's not just that the beginning is wedged in the end, but the end has something in it that becomes a keli, an actual container. Not just that the end doesn't have the revelations that are higher that conceal the, the essence of the beginning, but it actually is a container for that beginning. Remember, it left an impression on me, you know, the practical explanation, it had a little astronomical element to it. But then over the years, there's so much to say, but I'll just be brief due to time limits. I did want to honor him, and we'll talk about him again. Maybe I'll do a special program around Rabbi Yael. And when I really became closer to him and started working with him was in the years in the 1976, when I came to 770, the central yeshiva. And um, he was the mashpia there, so I learned in his shiurim, personally began to speak to him more at length. And, of course, started working then. I was very intrigued with the process of Chazara. I was, joined the group. Chazara was the small group that would come together after Shabbos and Yontif and review the Fabrengans. So that became, I became part of it, and I grew and excelled. And that's when we got closer. We would speak a lot. And later I became part, the edit, one of the editors of Sefer Lekutim, the encyclopedia of the Tzamech Tzedek Chizis. So then again, I worked with him getting some advice. I remember his biggest piece of advice says, the best advice I can give you I said to him, how do you, you know, how do you make an error? How do you take many ideas and put it in an organized fashion? He says, you learn like I learned. I said, how's that? Through mistakes. Well, wise piece of counsel. But then, when the Rebbe had the heart attack, Shemini Atzeres Tov Shalam Etches, 1977, October 1977, that's when I really began working closely with him. The Rebbe wanted to edit all the Fabrengans that he spoke. Those were after Yom Tov from his room with a microphone starting with Tzoyi Simchas just the day after the heart attack. And then Tzoyi Bereshis, and Tzoyi Noyach, Tzoyi Shabbos, the Rebbe would speak. And I became this second, like, uh, a sidekick, if you wish. I'd help him find sources, talk through ideas. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know how much he needed me, but I became close, and we used to fabring a lot. And I learned from him, you know, how you take an, uh, the Rebbe's ideas, how you research it, how you break it down, down into a structured way. That was when I really first got my first exposure. And we, hours and hours we would sit together. He had a very good sense of humor just to share one anecdote. I remember that it was the middle of the night, maybe three, four in the morning. Rabbi El suddenly turns to me, speaking in Yiddish. He says to me, Simon, will stand at table for Claudius at all? He called me by my name and said, Simon, you want to do a favor for the Claudius or for the general Jewish public? <laughs> for the general Jewish community. So I said, what, do you, want, you need cigarettes or coffee? He said, no, no. Memorize the whole Lukut Tater of the Alter Rebbe by heart. Now, Lukut Tater is a safer of hundreds of pages. So I said to him, half jokingly, you know, I said, you mean tonight? He said, no, 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 in time. He says, I said, why? Because everything in Chassidus is there. And that way we don't have to start searching for Mar Mekemis and sources. You'll know it all. Now, obviously, that was not a simple feat. I didn't end up doing it. But it was a part of that exchange, very friendly and very endearing. And this uh, captured and reflected a lot of my connections. So it's quite personal for me, the connection. I learned much from him. You know, we had our disagreements in the approach or disagreements in writing or even ideas. But that's all part of the progress, and it was uh, very healthy and growthful. And through those years, when I became the main writer of Fabrengan's, in, 
Chanukah, Shabbos Chanukah, Tov Shemem, the end of 1980, basically, the end of 1979, rather, beginning of Tov Shemem, Chanukah, Tov Shemem, the end of 1979. So I worked closely with him. We would Chazara, helping. Sometimes I would Chazar. He would ask me. I was the main writer. I would give the works to him, to Rabbi Yale, to review. We'd discuss matters, writing into the Rebbe, asking questions. It was, what can I say? It was the best of times, and it was uh, a deep connection. I learned much from him and have that gratitude and sense of debt. And yet, at the same time, he taught me also to develop my own skills, and uh, which I've tried to do. Each one of us has our own strengths. But I wanted to uh, honor that. Now, with his passing at age 91, just uh, for me, it's an era that captures so much of my life and how what shaped me and defined me. Um, and though the Rebbe, of course, is the driving force of it all, but Abiel was a key factor in my life and so many others of explaining, of presenting it. Also his bitl, his chsiddishkeit, total dedication to the Rebbe. And also taught was more than just ideas and how to convey ideas, but also what we call the lachluchis, the moisture, the spirit of the message, between the lines that I learned, especially in my impressionable years. But the greatest tribute to any teacher is that you can be a student that stands on your own feet. You're not dependent. You become shall have a selim a flame that rises on its own. In many ways, he was one of the factors that shaped me, and I feel that need to acknowledge that. I will share more about him as time allows. As I said, I may dedicate a program to him. And uh, so may his um, neshama go where it has to go. Be always close to the Rebbe because of the work that he did for all those years, the dedication. And there's much to share. Yes, there is much to share. I'll uh, add one more thing. I remember we spoke about, I was once, he once came to, to my office, to the office where we wrote the Fabrengans, and it was already Monday, and he said to me, anything for me to look over? So I said to him, not yet, I'll have later in the afternoon. He said, Monday, you don't have anything ready? So I said, Rabbi El, I don't begin writing until I have it all in my mind, like a vision of the whole. And then I begin, the first page can take me 10 hours, and the rest will go quickly. And then I don't even look back. He said, really, that's how you write? I said, yeah, and how do you write? He told me the exact opposite. I start writing right away. I said, what happens if it's wrong? He says, I go back and I fix it. And I realized there were two different writing styles. You know, to me, it was like more, my writing was more like from the Bechina Siria. I had to see the whole picture. I need to do all the research and all the details before I began. And by him, he built the Bederach Shmiya. In many ways, I've tried what he did, but I couldn't do it. Just a different style. In many ways, that has many more value because in some ways it gets much more, it's much clearer in certain aspects. Not to say, but I realize there's two different styles of writing and we discussed it at length and he really, he learned something, I learned something. We both could not do it another way. So it was an interesting insight about methods of writing. One, first you see the picture and then you start writing the details. When you start writing the details and the picture emerges. Obviously, both of them take in mind uh, the, the, the entire concept that the Rebbe spoke about. So, great times, great experiences, and um, the, the effect he had on myself and so many others will definitely live on as all great teachers, mashpim, and uh, contributions to explaining chassidus, making it very um, comprehensive in language that all of us can relate to. So, yeah. So let me conclude this spirit, Chassidus. I will say that when I started my life, Chassidus applied, I went to talk to Rabbi El. I wanted to hear his thoughts on it, of applying Chassidus to different psychological and personal issues. So that was also very, so he's in a way part of this. I got his blessing. So with that, let's go to the Chassidus question. What is the psycho-spiritual application of the nine days in Tisha B'Av, part two? Shalom of Rach. In episode 362, you apply the union of the nine days to low self-esteem. Yes, I explained that Malchus, which is the missing of the ten, the nine, is the Churm Besamidish, is Malchus. Malchus is Isnasus, Atmin, Isnas, Malchus is dignity, Malchuskeit, kingship, feeling special. So I described it as a, a wound in self-esteem. 
essentially the self-esteem that comes from our connection to godliness, which was revealed during the time of the Beis Amigdash. And that's why nine, ten is, is missing the, that one, even if you have all the other nine. According to this teaching, people with strong self-esteem and self-worth have already corrected this deficiency? Is that what you're saying? It only applies to spheres hamalchus and low, self, low spirit, spirited souls? How are broken souls a solution to correcting spheres samalchus? Painfully, if this is so important to Yiddishkeit, why is that only the, sec- that only the secular world is working so hard to find remedies for, for all mental brokenness? I'm not implying that there's no self-interest, corruption, and, recon- and recognize that the world also creates sabotage to self-esteem, that that secular world creates sabotage to self-esteem. Also, in this regard, how are the ten days in Tishrei different than the nine days of Ov? Sorry for venting. Thanks so much for sharing your time and knowledge to be Machazik Am Yisrael. Okay, so a bunch of questions here. So first of all, all of us, since Chetet Tzada, since it's Simpson Arishin, actually, have some form of dissonance, and therefore self-esteem is not perfect. Only in a world before the Tzimtzum, where Eid and Sof, the divine consciousness, all-encompassing, omnipresent, and there's no room for a second consciousness, there you have that seamlessness, which is the essence of what means being completely confident. Now, of course, nothing existed there, but there there's no room for any Question. There's no room for uh, schism. There's no room for doubt, for fear, for insecurity. As soon as God created the tzimtzum, which concealed the divine presence and allowed independent consciousness to emerge, independent consciousness, by definition, has the, comp- the potential for self-consciousness. Chet Eitzadah cemented it. Because now the consciousness of Adam and was no longer seamlessly connected to the divine. This is the birth of insecurity. The birth of the, the conflict between different voices, second-guessing yourself, insecurity, fear, inhibition, in a very subtle form. But then it exploded. As the generations passed, this malchus, which is the essence of who we are, becomes more and more concealed. When the moon got diminished, which is already earlier, the fourth day of creation, is also the same idea, the diminishment of the moon, of malchus the shattering of the containers, and the tzimtzum addition, in the reverse order, ultimately leading to our dissonance. That as soon as we feel in this world that I'm on my own, and I don't feel my purpose, or I'm not aligned to my purpose, that's the root of ultimately every form of insecurity. So there's no such thing as someone that people have stronger self-esteem than others. Some people's malchus is healthier than others. They're nurtured naturally. They just have a sense of connection. The more they don't focus on themselves, the more they focus on purpose and service of others, the healthier the self-esteem will be. But nobody has it completely corrected. That's why Tisha B'Av affects us all. Destruction of Esam Migdash affects us all. So it doesn't only apply to low-spirited souls. It applies to all souls. Low-spirited souls obviously manifest it more. And everyone needs the same correction. The, The correction is by realigning Malchus, by rebuilding the Beis Amidus, first of all within ourselves, and realigning it to its higher purpose. You asked, how are broken souls a solution to correcting Sphira Samalchus? When we recognize, you know, half the cure of a disease is awareness. When you recognize that you have some break, that you have some low self-esteem, you don't try to hide it with arrogance or self-delusion, like many people do. They hide their ignorance with their arrogance, or they hide their other deficiencies. You align yourself and you say, I feel the pgam, I feel the wound, the injury of Malchus, especially on Tisha B'av. When we cry, we cry for that Malchus, for the pgam, for the injury in Malchus. That is the beginning of all healing. Why the secular world focuses on it? First of all, I don't know how much they focus on it. There's more talk about it in secular language. But the whole Teda was this. The Teda was given to create peace. Peace isn't just peace between warring countries and between, uh, between people. It's peace also within yourself. Peace between your animal soul and your divine soul. Peace between your different conflicting voices and your conflicting interests and the things that drive you, the, the things that drive you and the things that tug at you. All psychological dissonance is what the Torah, especially Chassidus, was given to, uh, uh, 
to accomplish. And finally, the difference between the 10 days of Tishrei, good question. The Binyan Amalchus of Tishrei is at the end already of the third period of 40 days. The nine days is when Moshe is on the mountain and begging for forgiveness and not yet successful. So the break is very obvious. It's like right after 17th of Tammuz when, the, when they uh, built the golden calf before that, and the breaking of the tablets. So the injury is still very open. The wound is open. When you're getting ready to Rosh Hashanah, leading to Yom Kippur, the last 10 days, when Moshe finally gains forgiveness, now Malchus is already in a point after a month of El, of compassion, the 13 attributes of God, of divine compassion and mercy. Now you're coming to a point where you're actually rebuilding the relationship between God and the people, the relationship between you and your soul. Whereas by Tisha B'Av, the nine days, it's still the break. And it's only after Tisha B'Av where the Aliyah begins until the 15th of Av and finally concludes with Yom Kippur, the end of the 10 days of Tshuva, being in HaMalchus, but it's completed, the Malchus is completed in those 10 days. Okay. In episode 362, you, there was a question about safety driving during the nine days. In addition to the Tzedek, Tzedekah Pushka, which you mentioned, and the Mezuzah, which I never heard the Rebbe suggesting to put into a car, I would humbly remind you of the Rebbe's advice of having a chitas safer in the car, as well as stopping every hour during night driving and I believe every two hours during day driving. May these days be transformed into days of joy and celebration. So this is in addition to what I spoke last week about safety during these days. Thank God these days are now coming to an end. But we always have to be safety and the Rebbe did encourage a pushka and a chitas and the other suggestions that I just read. Okay, we'll conclude with the essays. The 30th place winners of the 6th annual My Life Citizen Applied Essay and Creative Contest. The essay in English, How Can I Feel Connected to Hashem at All Times? Very fitting to this subject. Yosef Yitzchuk Bank, age 23, student in Mayanot Men, hometown Johannesburg, South Africa. The essay in Hebrew of men, Be'ididim Be'yachad, to be alone together again. Very fitting to Badod, Echa Yoshva Badod. Gia Kaufman, student in Givatayim, Israel. The essay in Hebrew for women, Kera Veltheint, the Rebbe Sikh about turning over the world now and bring the Geula, because in every generation that the Geula is not brought, the Beis Amidish is not rebuilt, it's as if it destroyed the Beis Amidish. Ani Larber, Kfar Chabad, Israel. And finally, the creative, a magical meeting with the master of the good name, Baal Shem Tov. Short story by Sylvia Sara Esther Tillman, age 60, self-employed optometrist, hometown, and Sinitas, California. The essays, the English and the creative can be seen at chsidasapply.com, the Hebrew at diraloy.org, D-I-R-A-L-O.org. Chsidasapply.com, you can also find all the archives. You can submit a question completely anonymously, find all the previous essays and many, many more resources on chsidas. With that, let me conclude this Tisha B'Av with Yehofchu Yamameil Nesosun Simcha L'moyedim Tevim. The Moyed Gadol, the great holiday Tisha B'Av should become that great holiday revealing the intensity but channeled toward the positive with the Geula Hamit Vashlema. We're here every Sunday night, 8 to 9 p.m. My life is supplied. Thank you and may we be zechit to the Geula and only Simcha's Begoli Betev Hanira Vanigla. This program is brought to you by My Life, Hasidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at hasidusapplied.com slash donate.